I hope I don't give you indigestion, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll talk quickly. Thanks very much to uh, uh, John for that generous introduction and to David Hagee and everybody in the conference planning committee for putting this together. It's extraordinarily impressive. And what I thought I would try to do today is really go back to what we heard on Tuesday. Uh, because I thought the President of the United States really uh, presented us with a challenge. And I'll just repeat what he said, uh, but you all heard it. Uh, what the cynics fail to understand is that the ground has shifted beneath them, that the stale political arguments that have consumed us for so long no longer apply. The question we ask today is not whether our government is too big or too small, but whether it works where the answer is yes, we intend to move forward, where the answer is no, programs will end. And those of us who manage the public's dollars will be held to account to spend wisely, reform bad habits, and do our business in the light of day, because only then can we restore the vital trust between a people and their government. Uh, and I think that just applies to all of us in the criminal justice community. <clears throat> And I think what's marked uh, uh, this movement, and I'm looking around the room, and uh, there are many of us here that have been involved in uh, certainly the transfer of DNA technology from medical and uh, uh, research uses uh, to the forensic arena since 1988, 87. Uh, my partner Peter Neufeld and I were involved in this, and many people in this room uh, on all sides of uh, the aisle, whether they were prosecutors or judges, have. Uh, uh, been with us on that journey. And I think that in the end, uh, certainly it's the philosophy of the Innocence Projects uh, that uh, we have shared goals. Uh, that's to protect the innocent, to enhance capability of law enforcement to catch the guilty, and to take advantage of this learning moment of these DNA exonerations as we identify the causes and we create remedies. These are all win-win propositions, public safety matters, whether it be eyewitness eyewitness misidentification, unreliable or misapplied forensic science, false confessions, jailhouse snitches, attorney misconduct, or the most difficult problem of all, race. Now, just in the spirit of getting past all arguments, I just want to share something with you personally, uh, because uh, it shows anything can happen. Uh, Peter Neufeld and I litigated a case, I think for about uh, close to a year, uh, in federal court before uh, Judge uh, Jim Carr uh, against Jim Woolley. And Jim Woolley, as many of you remember, was the assistant United States attorney who really was the point person uh, for the FBI and the federal government uh, when it came to litigating issues concerning uh, the reliability of uh, DNA testing systems. And we really uh, had a, uh, a, a really intense litigation. Uh, but I'm proud to say that Jim is my friend. And uh, Jim now works for the Baker Hostetler firm in Cleveland. Uh, and he has helped recently on a, uh, a matter that I think just exemplifies everything uh, uh, about this movement. Uh, Michael Green uh, was a, a young man who worked in the Cleveland Clinic uh, in downtown Cleveland. He worked in the, uh, uh, the kitchen uh, when a young woman who was a nurse from West Virginia uh, was getting cancer treatment. Uh, was sexually assaulted uh, by somebody, it, is this uh, fading here? Uh, was sex, can you hear me in the back? Oh, there you go. Uh, this young woman was sexually assaulted uh, by somebody who called himself Tony, uh, and it was plainly an inside job. Uh, so when the police and the Cleveland Clinic police began investigating this, uh, they looked for the last guy that was let go. And uh, Michael Green had been let go from the kitchen because he had brought a friend in there to work while he was working. And his name was Anthony Michael Green, even though he was known as Michael. So this immediately made him subject of suspicion. Uh, photographs were shown to this victim his, with his picture in it. Uh, uh, some things happened there that I'm sure aren't very good. Uh, I know aren't very good. Uh, the police officer said that he didn't, he had an alibi that he was with his family in the neighborhood, but the police officer said that he got drunk and passed out. Uh, he went to trial, he was convicted. Uh, he went before the parole boards and they said, you can get out early if you admit guilt. He refused to admit guilt. Uh, we, we came to uh, get access to the evidence in a DNA test. The DNA test proved him uh, to be innocent. He was exonerated and he left jail. And for the next year, he had a very tough time. And then Connie Schultz, 
who is the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, who incidentally is married to uh, uh, the senator there now, uh, uh, wrote a story called The Burden of Innocence, where she put Michael's picture on the front page of the paper. Uh, and after she did that, believe it or not, the real assailant saw that picture, read that story, consulted with the priest, came forward and admitted he committed the crime, uh, which was an extraordinary moment. And then when he uh, was sentenced, the first person in the courtroom to ask did he get the minimum sentence for having come forward for this was Michael Green. Uh, subsequently, a civil suit was filed uh, because the serology evidence in the case and the hair comparison uh, uh, was not reliably presented by the Cleveland uh, criminalist Joseph Sirowek. In fact, he even gave a number on a hair. I mean, it was one in something like 40,000. Gave numbers on hairs. And of course, the serology statistics were all wrong. Um, a civil suit was filed, and uh, as Sirowek was deposed, and as uh, uh, evidence was collected from the laboratory in other cases, uh, it became clear that there were extremely serious problems. Uh, so uh, on the eve of the civil trial, uh, we were able to get a settlement of this case, uh, and Jim Woolley was very helpful in that because what we were able to do, Michael Green gave $500,000 out of what he would have received in his uh, total settlement with uh, the Cleveland Clinic and the city of Cleveland. Uh, to conduct an audit of 16 years' worth of Joseph Sirowick cases. And Jim Woolley ran that audit. Um, and some good things have come out of it. And we've learned something from it. So that's, that's a case. Uh, and, and Jim's helped on lots of other things. Uh, Woody Clark, uh, I think almost from the very beginning of this DNA era, Woody and Rock Carmen have been the designated prosecutors uh, in many of these instances who would be talking about the DNA technology. And Woody was on the uh, DNA commission uh, uh, that was set up on the future of DNA evidence. Uh, and you know we were all way able to work together and particularly the training materials, what every law enforcement officer ought to know about DNA testing and how that was distributed. And uh, many of the issues that rose when we were discussing category two cases uh, uh, this morning about how you identify what is probative evidence, how you get redundancy between results with different technologies, how you really work a crime scene so that we can uh, uh, find the person who really did it and make sure we don't arrest the wrong person, uh, much less convict them, uh, an enormous contribution there. And I only cite, there's so many other people from the commission like Judge Reinstein and uh, others here who did great work, but I'm only citing the people that I had contentious litigation with, because that's the whole point, right? Um, <clears throat> Uh, Howard Safer and Ruli Giuliani. Now, Peter Neufeld and I sued these guys a lot um, for civil rights violations. And we were, uh, the Abner Louima case, I mean, we were not uh, political allies of uh, uh, Mayor Giuliani or Howard Safer. But uh, wearing the hat uh, of, P of commissioner on the New York Forensic Science Commission, which I'll discuss in a minute, uh, uh, the criminal justice coordinator then, Katie Lapp, brought me in to meet with Howard Safer, and he tells this story, as many of you might have heard, uh, and he said, well, what are we doing wrong? And I said, this is what you're doing wrong. You have 1,400 rape kits in the city of New York that are unsolved. You've got to test those to find the real perpetrator. Uh, you're not working burglaries, uh, to, uh, which really is a gateway crime where you can find a lot of biological evidence. You've got to get your cold case squad looking at these things more carefully. That's what you've got to do. And uh, Howard said, OK, we'll get those cold cases done. Uh, you watch. Rudy and I, we can really cut through red tape. You watch. Four years later, <laughs> uh, they were finally able to get, uh, with you know, requests for bid out, uh, those 14,000 rape kits uh, examined. Um, and, that, and we were one of the leaders in doing that. Uh, but it got done. And that's the kind of thing that can really happen here. And then finally, of course, in a related area, there's uh, my friend Rock Harmon, uh, who I think has been uh, incredibly vigilant, particularly in this area, because you know we look at these uh, uh, cold cases and these data bank hits, um, and one of the real problems, and it, uh, 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 it angers us in terms of the sclerosis of the bureaucracy, is that sometimes even when you get a data bank hit, nobody's following up to arrest the bad guy. And we all know of cases where that's happened. So just on an individual basis, I think that uh, within this community, uh, there's an enormous amount of common ground 
and a real way to get past uh, the stale arguments of the past. Now I'm going to refer back to uh, the post-conviction DNA testing recommendations for handling requests just to review a little of that history, and I don't know if you've read this document recently, but when uh, the commission uh, was first formed on the future of DNA evidence, uh, Judge Abramson and uh, Chris Aswin, who is the executive director, uh, myself, and I can't remember who else was in this original planning meeting, uh, uh, the determination was made, well, the first thing we've got to do is deal with these post-conviction issues. Uh, it really uh, was at the uh, strong urging of Janet Reno that all of this happened because she looked at that first monograph uh, convicted uh, by juries, exonerated by science, looking at the first 28, 29 cases, uh, and it really upset her, and that's why she really went full speed ahead in setting up this commission uh, and moving forward on quite a number of initiatives. But if you go back and read the report, when we started our work, uh, I think there were 29 exonerations, there were two state post-conviction statutes in Illinois and New York. Only 15 states had newly discovered evidence of innocent statutes with sa statutes of limitations uh, that were uh, uh, three years. Uh, and many jurisdictions, you could not even go to court if somehow you got the DNA evidence and file a newly discovered evidence of innocence uh, uh, claim. Uh, in fact, in Virginia, as you all recall, there was a 21-day rule. That's why all the early exonerations in Virginia came by gubernatorial pardon. Uh, and so uh, the determination was made uh, that we ought to move forward very, very quickly uh, in this area, and we convened this working group uh, chaired by Judge Reinstein. And the first thing that I have to say uh, is that uh, I was immediately saying, well, let's pass a statute. Let's create a model statute so we can get it passed in all the states. Um, and the others there said, well, no, you know, you really uh, would really be better off if we put together a set of recommendations and got them out right away as to what are the cases there. Obviously, there should be DNA testing, the category one cases, um, and what cases reasonable people can disagree about. Uh, let's get those out right away. Let's put that out to the community and you'll see there'll be a lot of uh, consent testing uh, between prosecutors and defense lawyers, uh, and, and judges will just order it, even though there's no legal basis for it in theory. Uh, and that was really a correct judgment. Although, uh, I, I can't resist, when we were talking about Category 1 cases, uh, conscience uh, impels me to say uh, that in a plain Category 1 case in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Archie Williams, we have litigated that for 12 years, 12 years, and finally got access to the testing uh, uh, and testing last week. So uh, I think in general, uh, most prosecutors, most judges, most defense lawyers, we all mean well, we all try to have a meeting of the minds, but there have been cases. <laughs> uh, it breaks my heart that we had to litigate that for 12 years, going up and down the state courts, into federal court, 1983s, Louisiana passes a statute. You had to go all the way to the Louisiana Supreme Court on an obvious single perpetrator rape category one case. So that can happen uh, in any event. If you look at category, the, the one thing I'd like to say, and you uh, 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 heard we Dow talk about our method. Uh, when we and his uh, crack team uh, at intake, and it's, they're, they're an extraordinary bunch, uh, we won't take a case as a client unless we think it is a category one case, unless we believe DNA evidence can actually prove innocence. Now, of course, uh, what uh, Ted was talking about this morning is true. We now have such uh, remarkable uh, technology that you have to start looking at, oh, there's touch DNA here. You, you all know about the case in Colorado, uh, Masters, uh, where uh, the body was dragged across a road, and uh, therefore it was believed that the assailant would have touched the trousers and touched other part of the clothing uh, of the victim. Uh, Masters is convicted, but there was another suspect. Uh, sure enough, when they did this touch DNA, which is really just an enhanced extraction procedure, they got redundancy of results. It matched uh, the person that was the original suspect. Uh, uh, he was exonerated. So when you start thinking about data bank hits, redundant results, why DNA testing? Uh, 
Uh, and uh, as Barry mentioned this morning, although I think uh, absolutely I'd be the first person to say don't let it into court unless it's uh, uh, adequately validated, uh, whether it's low copy DNA or now these mini satellites, uh, we have an extraordinary uh, uh, toolbox that's only getting bigger, uh, which makes these cases a little bit more interesting. Um, and the, the commission finally did put together a model statute, and I think if you go back and look at the report, it very patiently predicted the legal issues. The very issue that's in front of the United States Supreme Court today in Osborne, uh, I think it's laid out extremely well in that document, anticipating it. Uh, I think that the chapters on what prosecutors should do, defense lawyers should do, judges, and most importantly, uh, victim advocates, and how that whole issue should be handled because it's always been our position at the Innocence Project. We do not talk to victims. Uh, we do not want them to learn the results uh, in the newspapers. Uh, that responsibility, we want to have victim advocates taken care of, Vine uh, uh, notification, we always think about that. And as a matter of fact, in that uh, McGowan case that Mike Ware was discussing with you, uh, one of the reasons that it took so long is that it took quite a while to find the victim uh, and for uh, the Conviction Integrity Unit to be able to have uh, some meaningful discussions with her about what was going to occur. And, and that's very appropriate under all these circumstances. The only exception, when you read this report, that wasn't altogether prescient, if you look at page three, it says the following. The need for post-conviction DNA testing will wane over time. Within the next de decade, DNA testing with highly discriminatory results will undoubtedly be performed in the vast majority of cases in which biological evidence is relevant. Furthermore, advanced technologies that are not yet in all the laboratories will become commonplace. When that occurs, requests for post-conviction DNA relief uh, uh, will cease for the most part. Well, that ain't why you're all here. <laughs> Uh, it hasn't, and the exonerations have gone up, um, and a lot of that, I think, is because better efforts are being made to find the evidence. Uh, a lot of times when we were originally told the evidence was lost or destroyed, it turned out you could later find it. Uh, uh, wasn't where it was supposed to be, but that's a whole issue that we're going to discuss, uh, I think, this afternoon uh, when it comes to evidence preservation. Uh, but that's interesting, and the, 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 the truth is, is that the more we form uh, uh, institutions, uh, whether it be conviction integrity units, innocence projects, or however it's done, the more we find evidence and the more exonerations we have. Now, there are 227 post-conviction DNA exonerations, and let's be clear by what we mean. Uh, these are cases where it's the DNA results that was the primary basis for vacating the conviction. Uh, Weedow keeps this number and he's very careful. It's got to be primarily due to DNA. There's a lot of cases where the convictions were vacated and the charges were dismissed, where DNA did not play the primary role. We don't count them. Uh, uh, in these cases, uh, the charges have to be dismissed, uh, the indictment dismissed, or the uh, individual receive a pardon. Uh, it, there can also be acquittals, but I think it's only one or two cases that ever went, went to retrial. And one of them, the Rolando Cruz case, by the time they were finishing the second retrial, the prosecutor got indicted for things that were happening to bring the retrial. So that's a comparatively rare event. Uh, we keep this data, and you know, we're more and more uh, scholars uh, uh, and social scientists are looking at this data, and uh, the key to it is it's transparent. We're trying to collect it as best we can, but it's transparent. So if you look at the website and you read a case and you say, you know, I don't really think this guy's innocent, Right? You know, tell us. And if uh, new proof emerges, we'll take it down. Uh, but uh, as it stands right now, we, we do stand behind these 227 cases. Uh, now 44 states have statutes, and as David uh, uh, Rudofsky was explaining this morning, <coughs> uh, this issue of access, the right of access, is now before the United States Supreme Court. This is just a chart that gives you the statistics that we presented uh, in the question and answer session this afternoon. Uh, we have had trouble getting exact numbers on uh, what happened with the testing because in the early days when Peter and I were doing consults uh, and assisting attorneys, uh, we didn't keep track of what happened. So in other words, we know uh, that I think it's like 155 of the cases 
uh, uh, the Innocence Project uh, was either uh, the attorney of record or assisted. Um, but I don't know what happened to the other cases where we helped people get DNA testing and what the results were. So we can't count those in order to uh, uh, give a sound number. So uh, since the Innocence Project became a private independent entity uh, uh, in 2004, uh, and uh, our executive director, Maddie Delone, who if you haven't met her, she's just terrific, uh, and we've grown uh, enormously uh, from, you know, like five or six people uh, at the time uh, these recommendations were put together to a staff of uh, uh, 50. Uh, we now have better record keeping, and so the statistics that uh, we gave you uh, this afternoon, that there were 43.3% uh, exclusions, no results in 7.2% of the cases, not proven in 7.2%, and the DNA exclusions were 42.3, inclusions 42.3%. Uh, uh, these are hard numbers from uh, uh, records that henceforth I, I think are pretty sound. Uh, but I was very intrigued uh, by the fact that the Conviction Integrity Unit in Dallas, Mike Ware was saying, he, he almost had exactly the same thing. I guess it was like a 50-50 split. I suspect that over time, or even if we had all the statistics, it, it, there might be somewhat more inclusions than inclusions. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter, does it? All these people were supposed to be guilty. They were proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. They lost appeals. They often lost state habeas. They lost in the federal courts and habeas. Uh, guilty, 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 guilty. Uh, uh, and what's, uh, these are just extraordinary numbers. Uh, now, the causes of wrongful convictions, uh, we also updated these for you uh, with hard numbers. Uh, looking at the 227 cases, 75% eyewitness misidentification, that's 172 of them. Non-valid or improper forensic science, more than 50%, about 119. We're getting an exact count in that number, and for our friends in the forensic science community, we're going to present to you exactly uh, how we reach those conclusions in all these cases uh, with the help of some consultants, and so you all can double check it. Uh, false confessions or admissions, approximately 25% of the cases, 52 of them, and the reason we say approximately, there have been some of these cases where it was a false confession by defendant number one, but it exonerated his co-defendant, right? So we count both exonerations, even though it was one false confession. So those numbers, uh, uh, you can see what they actually are, but that's the way we're counting them. Uh, jailhouse snitches, 36 or 15 percent, and here, of course, is the most important number of all, and it is getting bigger because of the databases, and that is that in 40% of the cases now, approximately 40% or 89 instances, the real assailant has been identified. So one thing that I think we have to look forward, uh, we have to look to going forward, is that we all do want better data. Uh, not just about these DNA exonerations, that'll be comparatively easy to put together than some of these cases, but just about system-wide. Uh, uh, the truth is that we don't, look in jurisdictions systematically uh, about what happened when uh, non-DNA evidence, uh, a conviction is vacated uh, based on newly discovered evidence of innocence. What went wrong? What can we learn to improve in terms of the investigative process? Or even when indictments are filed and then police or prosecutors realize it's the wrong person. What happened there? Uh, we don't keep track of these uh, uh, relevant statistics in terms of the error rate of our system. And uh, a very wise uh, uh, social scientist I met at Carnegie Mellon uh, once said, if you want to change an institution, change its paperwork. And so one of the, uh, uh, I think, real challenges for us is to do better data collection. Uh, now I'm just going to make a series of observations, uh, sort of big picture kinds of things, uh, about how we can go forward and get past stale arguments and some of the uh, uh, things that are already happening and things that we can look to do better going forward. Uh, now the first issue uh, is what we've loosely called innocence commissions, but it really stems from uh, a suggestion that we made uh, in Actual Innocence, the book that uh, Peter and I wrote with Jim Dwyer. Uh, and there we actually proposed something that there ought to be commissions that are uh, similar to the National Transportation and Safety Board. I'm sure you've all heard the arguments 
you know, what happens when a plane falls from the sky or a train derails. You bring in the NTSB. It's a small organization that speaks truth to power. They have the opportunity to call in other experts to investigate. And all they're supposed to figure out is what went wrong and how can we fix it. It's not an assignment of civil liability. Uh, uh, their results can't be used for that purpose. But what went wrong and how can we fix it? Many times the NTSB makes recommendations to the Federal Aeronautics Administration and they just go, well, it's too expensive. We can't save all that evidence, right? We can't test absolutely everything, as Barry Fisher was pointing out this morning. But uh, the NTSB goes in there and really tries to figure out how we can fix the system. Now, the first, I think, efforts to look at this in a systematic way uh, are, are what are known as the Ryan Commission reports. And as you recall, when it turned out that uh, there were more exonerations of uh, death row in Illinois than there were uh, people executed, uh, uh, Governor Ryan declared a moratorium on capital punishment and eventually gave clemencies to 174 people, giving them life in prison. Uh, but during that period of time, the Illinois legislature uh, started looking at all the causes of wrongful convictions and came up with legislation uh, that would try to fix it. Uh, and one of the leaders there uh, was then a little-known state senator named Barack Obama, uh, who carried a number of the bills, most prominently the videotaping of interrogation bills. So uh, I can state to you with real authority uh, that the President of the United States is looking very carefully at this community and what we can come up with, uh, because uh, he is, after all, a constitutional scholar. And when he was working in the legislature in Illinois, he tackled these problems. And as a matter of fact, as you heard during the course of the campaign, he cited this work as an example of how he was able to cross the aisle uh, uh, with Republicans and uh, with others to create consensus legislation. Uh, so after the Ryan Commission reports, uh, I would, in doing our little history here, uh, I would uh, go back to a meeting that the American Judicature Society put on, really with the help of Janet Reno and, of course, Lori Robinson. Uh, and, uh, you know, Larry Hammond is here, who was on the planning committee, Governor Bill Ritter uh, of Colorado was. And uh, what was done then is, just like here, uh, I think we had 24 teams from different states across the country, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, uh, everybody came to Alexandria, Virginia, and it really was just the, the first run, the first cut at what, is, what, what can we do to improve this system in light of all these exonerations? What remedies uh, uh, can we take? And um, out of that meeting, it's, I, I can really trace it looking at the people in the room. Things began to happen. Uh, Justice Beverly Lake, with the uh, uh, great support of her then law clerk, uh, and now Innocence Project uh, uh, Commissioner Head, so many uh, different uh, hats that uh, uh, Chris Muma wears so effectively, North Carolina, they formed the commission. And they immediately went out looking at eyewitness reform and other matters. Uh, the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice, I think, is a really good one to look at uh, because they put everything online, issued a big report, and systematically took on each of the issues, uh, including the, the very difficult question of capital punishment as a system issue. Pennsylvania is now involved in a very serious uh, process that is a, a legislative, uh, uh, legislatively enacted innocence commission to come up with reforms. Uh, Connecticut, we had one uh, not as successful as we would like. It was uh, uh, between uh, uh, University of New Haven with a lot of police people and Yale Law School. Uh, uh, some things came out of that, but we could have done a lot better there. Uh, uh, Judge Kirby is here. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals um, actually has been working uh, on a review of all these reforms itself. Uh, and uh, was holding hearings in the last few months, uh, which is really an extraordinary event. And we have the New York State Bar Association that's looking at all of the New York exonerations and issuing a, a report that we expect uh, really at the end of the month, uh, maybe the beginning of February. Now, all these are great, but we are going over the same ground state by state. And so the idea that I commend to you is why shouldn't we have a national commission uh, that looks at uh, uh, ways that we can improve the administration of justice, looking at all these different areas, getting the ideas from each different state, uh, from all sides, uh, and following the injunction of our president, you know, the most important thing is not whose idea it is, 
or uh, how it does, does it work, right? Does it work? Uh, and with that pragmatic notion in mind, I think we could benefit uh, uh, from a blue, blue ribbon commission and meetings such as this that uh, a national commission can assist the states uh, in trying to figure out how we can uh, move forward on all these remedies uh, uh, for the causes of wrongful conviction, which after all are just good public safety measures. Uh, I'd like to just review uh, uh, quickly, and you've heard about them already, some of the models uh, that have emerged for the DNA review. And uh, 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 Mike Ware, uh, uh, Craig Watkins, uh, and all the people, Terry Moore at the Dallas District Attorney's Office, it's been really uh, quite an extraordinary uh, journey uh, with all these exonerations. But I want to emphasize something uh, uh, that Mike was talking about, and that is the information sharing. When you open up all the files and we just look at them, right, uh, that makes it faster. And there's, there's agreement. I remember Woody Clark and I figured that uh, when we were on the commission, we could look at these cases and we would agree on close to 99 and 9 tenths percent of the cases. Uh, uh, because there really, there really is a, a, a lot of, uh, a, big, a big ground of consensus here in looking at them. It's efficient and uh, it really gives you an opportunity to share investigative data in a very sensitive way. Uh, there's one case, for example, uh, uh, where we were able to identify the person who really committed the crime uh, and actually gave the information uh, to the Dallas uh, District Attorney's Office so they could go out and arrest this guy for murder, right? Uh, and equally, uh, in one of the really extraordinary cases that uh, Mike mentioned in passing, uh, the Stephen Phillips case, and here's a guy that was convicted of a very crazy kind of sexual assault uh, where he would walk, person would walk in uh, to uh, uh, exercise areas where women were, driving up in a, what was a red El Dorado, and he had a certain kind of mask and a German Luger and all kinds of really distinctive features uh, to the crimes, and uh, uh, Phillips is identified there. He goes to trial, he's convicted, he realizes that if he's going to ever see the light of day again, he might as well plead to the other five. This was one of the cases that uh, 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 Craig Watkins' prede predecessor didn't uh, agree to test. Uh, they not only went back and we got testing results uh, on the uh, crime for which he was convicted, but most importantly, the investigator in the Conviction Integrity Unit, Jim Hammond, went out and did things that we wouldn't do and can't do as effectively uh, on the defense side and eventually found this uh, serial offender that had committed literally hundreds of offenses like this, and probably in the final analysis, in Wichita, Kansas, in uh, Houston, in Los Angeles, all across the country, uh, a, a real one-man crime wave. I hear that uh, the Arizona Justice Project uh, is being set up in the same way now in terms of the uh, sharing of information. So the thing I'd really like to stress about this is that I don't think the models work uh, that well when it's just the prosecutors doing it themselves or frankly it's just the Innocence Projects uh, uh, working in a completely adversarial posture. Uh, it really helps uh, to share information. You won't always agree, uh, but there are ways to proceed uh, that really help. And I think uh, without talking more about it, I think the other thing that we ought to look at in terms of a big idea is that we all know in the non-DNA cases in particular, if one goes back and tries to figure out whether an injustice has been committed, uh, whether somebody is actually innocent. It is extremely hard to get into any court, state or federal, uh, and really litigate or present that claim. Uh, I don't think Article III courts really are designed that way. And we really should start thinking more of alternative institutions to resolve these factual disputes, probably along the lines uh, that has worked pretty well at the Criminal Case Review Commission in the United Kingdom, which just had its 10th anniversary uh, I was over there uh, celebrating that, and it was impressive. Uh, it really was impressive what they've accomplished there. Another kind of cooperative effort that I'd like to share with you, uh, just so you see how this is working, has to do with uh, <coughs> composite bullet lead analysis. I'm sure you all remember that in 2005, the National Research Council came down with the finding uh, that uh, composite bullet lead analysis testimony is presented by FBI analysts, because this was something only the FBI was doing, uh, uh, lacked 
uh, scientific merit uh, in uh, the way it was presented. And specifically, uh, in cases where you can't do tool marked examinations on a bullet, uh, but you just are looking at the chemical composition, what the FBI analysts would do going back to 1973 is they would analyze the bullet to see its chemical composition. And an assumption was made that when you have a big melt of bullets from which you can make 32 million bullets, all right, but within a block there was an assumption that you would have the same chemical composition within a block. And there was a further assumption that if you had two different blocks they would have different chemical compositions. And certainly as to the first assumption, it turned out to be plainly wrong. So what would happen is, is that FBI age analysts would come into court and they'd say, this bullet came from this box of ammunition. It was manufactured within a certain date, or it's uh, comparatively rare. We'll look at how many are sold within the jurisdiction, and they give uh, statements like that, which could be very important in cases. Uh, so that report came out in 2004. Uh, but frankly, it was paralyzing in terms of even following up on it. Uh, my friend Dwight Adams, who's another person I should have put on the uh, list because I spent a lot of, t I think I cross-examined Dwight in the early days for two weeks, right? Uh, uh, Jim Woolley would remember, for two weeks on validation studies uh, for the initial uh, uh, use of DNA. He became head of the Science Bureau in the FBI and a terrific public servant. Uh, so he first uh, looked, uh, shepherded, uh, the, uh, went along with the NRC recommendations. The FBI eventually abandoned doing any composite bullet lead analysis. But uh, we realized uh, uh, that nothing was happening with the cases. Lawyers weren't picking up on this. Uh, they didn't follow this. Uh, so 60 Minutes, the Washington Post, and the Innocence Project did a joint story, ran in the Washington Post, was on 60 Minutes, uh, uh, about this issue. Why aren't prosecutors uh, uh, being notified that the FBI no longer stands behind the testimony of its uh, agents? Um, and as we went through that process, uh, Valor Caproni, who was counsel to the FBI, and John Miller, who's their public spokesperson, who, when he was a reporter at NBC News, worked on some exoneration cases with Peter and I, uh, they actually said, you know what? You're right. You're right. You guys are right about this. We have to notify the courts and the prosecutors, that this is no longer evidence that we can stand behind. But not in every case. We want to look at it carefully. So we put together a team of uh, members of the Innocence Network, uh, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the Innocence Project, and the law firm of Winston and Strawn. And we signed a protective order with the FBI, and we now review the cases. And uh, uh, they've done an incredible job. They're never going to find them all. Uh, but going back, looking at who testified uh, where, uh, we had to eliminate the guilty pleas, but we just went back and started looking at the testimony. The FBI would send out letters to the prosecutors saying, give me the transcripts. They came back, they look at the transcripts, they make an evaluation, and then they send out letters. Um, and usually the letters are pretty much in two categories. One is, uh, this is a bullet to box case, and we're telling you that the uh, uh, agent's testimony is wholly without merit. Or they'll say uh, it's kind of an exaggeration case. Uh, they are implied or stated the bullet came from the box and it exceeds the limit of the science, or the testimony were about the number of bullets exceeded the limits of the science. And very careful protocol was worked out in these discussions. Um, and then they started sending out letters. And every letter they send out, and the, the letters are really kind of fun. I, I, you can't read it. But uh, actually, this is a copy of the protective order. Uh, but then they'll send out a letter uh, basically uh, saying to the prosecutor, this evidence isn't any good anymore. Uh, you see how much that matters to the case. And we're working with the Innocence Project on this. And we've told the state judge, and be aware that they may you know, uh, be knocking on the door to follow up to see if we can find the clients. Um, and then they literally send us the letters they're sending out. We have this big spreadsheet. And we had a meeting uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. about a month ago uh, saying, well, you know, we've looked at some of these letters and we've reviewed the transcripts and we don't think uh, that you're actually following the protocol you laid out. And they reviewed them and they said, well, we agree with you on these cases and we're sending out revised letters uh, and we disagree with you on this, we're standing to our position. Well, that's fine. Uh, and that is the kind of process that can really move forward. And I, I, I think you have to agree it's a fairly unusual effort, isn't it? Um, uh, and uh, there have already been exonerations. Uh, there's, uh, well, 
a conviction vacated, uh, uh, eights. Uh, the letter went out. We didn't even find the defendant. The prosecutor in Florida took one look at this. He said this was a close case. Uh, this really mattered. Uh, I'm coming into my own motion and vacating this conviction. Uh, and we'll see whether he's retried. Uh, and that was a murder case. A lot of these are very serious cases. There's a case, a death penalty case, Mordante. Uh, the CBLA figured in the va vacatur of the conviction, and then he was given a time-served plea. So, you know, where I come from, that sounds like a win. Uh, <laughs> then we have forensic science commissions. Yeah, I got to go on, huh? How much? Oh, I'm almost finished. All right. Let me, uh, I could go on and on, as you well know. Uh, what's important to say? All right, last thing I, that's important to say. Uh, we all know, uh, one of the things that the president said in his uh, inaugural is that it's really time to restore science to its rightful place in government. Uh, and we are expecting soon that the National Academy of Sciences, which has been doing this big report looking at the needs of this community, is going to uh, issue a report probably in the middle of February uh, that looking, for, looking at the presentations uh, is going to be quite extraordinary. And it is going to um, deal with issues about the validity and reliability of a number of forensic assays, pattern evidence, tool marks, things of that nature. Uh, probably call for, uh, I hope, for a National Institute of Forensic Science and a science-based agency of the federal government to conduct more applied and basic research and put real money into this and more money into the crime labs. Uh, it's also going to do something, the last point I forgot. Uh, one thing that you all should think about now is a statute, a statute that permits the defense to make a motion to the court uh, with good cause shown to have a court order to have a DNA profile put into the CODIS database before trial or after trial, and forget CODIS, APHIS, the Automatic Fingerprint Identification System is the most underutilized uh, tool uh, for catching criminals and exonerating the wrongly convicted. You should also have a right to access that database, but the problem with the APHIS database, any of you working in the system know, you can't even do a comparison of a fingerprint in New York to New Jersey. Those were the presentations in front of the National Academy. Uh, and there are so many problems with that, and there's so much uh, difficulty in getting good latents into the system and measuring them. Uh, uh, this is a key area that all of you in the crime labs, all of us in prosecution and defense should be looking at. This APHIS uh, data bank system has to be changed and we should really take advantage of it. Thank you very much and for being patient.